Join Wondery Plus and Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app to listen to American innovations early and ad-free. It's a warm summer evening in 1935 on a residential street in Manchester, Connecticut. Nine-year-old Henry Molaison holds his breath as his father winds up and hurls a baseball high in the air like a pop fly. Henry settles under the ball and watches it descend, holding his baseball glove over his head. He flinches as the ball bounces off the heel of his glove and rolls onto the grass. Hey, keep your eye on the ball, son. I'm trying, Dad. Henry picks up the ball and whips it back, with his eyes cast down. It sails high towards their front windows. Henry cringes, but his father, Gus, leaps and grabs it with a grin. Now, Henry, squat down and play catcher. Let me get a few pitches in. Suddenly, Henry's mom, Lizzie, calls out from the front steps. Gus, no, he hates that. Henry, you don't have to play catcher if you don't feel like it. Henry bristles at this. He hates the pity in her voice. His mom has always been overprotective of him, but he's not a toddler anymore. He's nine years old. He ignores her and looks at his dad. I'll play catcher. You sure, son? Henry nods and smacks his fist in his glove like he's seen his dad do. boy. All right, here comes the heat. The ball comes so fast that Henry closes his eyes, ducks his head, and stabs blindly, knocking the ball with the tip of his glove. It bounces beneath the parked car and rolls into the street. Henry's cheeks burn as he runs to fetch the ball, annoyed at his mother's voice. Be careful, Henry, dear. As Henry darts into the street, he's so frustrated with himself that he doesn't look left or right. He never sees the bicycle speeding toward him. Before Henry realizes what's happening, his world is upside down. The sky below him, his feet in the air. He goes flying. After that, things go black. When he wakes up, there's a crowd of people pressing in, looking horrified. His parents are there, and his mother is shaking him. Henry, Henry, speak to me. Are you okay? He has a splitting headache. How did he end up on the ground? Where am I? Every time somebody moves above him, his head swims. Soon, a wave of nausea flashes over him, and he vomits. Suddenly, a blur flashes to his left. It takes Henry a minute to realize that it's his father, standing up. I'm calling an ambulance. He watches his father turn away and recede into the crowd. But it all seems so distant. He starts to call after his dad, asking him not to leave. But then, his vision narrows into a tunnel, and everything goes black. From Wondery, I'm Stephen Johnson, and this is American Innovations. Nowadays, it's common to talk about different types of memory. There are the ones most people are familiar with, short-term memory, working memory, muscle memory, and even finer distinctions that scientists use. We also understand that different parts of the brain control different types of memory. But these discoveries were hard won, and they were made possible by a single grave mistake. A mistake with tragic consequences for a man named Henry Molaison, who never intended to become one of science's most valuable human guinea pigs. Molaison was not a neuroscientist. He was a neurological patient. After suffering a head injury as a child, he developed severe epilepsy at a time when the condition was hard to treat and heavily stigmatized. He grew desperate enough for a cure that he agreed to undergo a radical experimental surgery. That surgery destroyed Molaison's life as he knew it, but it also had major consequences for neuroscience. What Molaison lost in brain functioning, specifically in the way his brain processed and stored memories, we gain in understanding. This is episode one of our three-part series on The Man With No Memory, The Accident. It's June 1939, a mile above Hartford, Connecticut, and 13-year-old Henry Molaison is beside himself with excitement. 
As a junior high graduation present, his parents bought him a plane ride. He's been dreaming about it for weeks. He's sitting in the co-pilot seat in the cockpit of a small prop plane. The interior is green leather and smells brand new. The pilot turns to him. Where's your house, kid? On Hollister Street in Manchester? Oh, that's about 10 miles. Right over there. Henry's eyes follow the pilot's finger. There's a cove below where people park their yachts and a gated community of mansions surrounding it. Beyond that, he can see the much smaller houses of his neighborhood. He can't make out his own house, but he can see the forest behind it where he goes hunting for birds. Sadly, he hasn't been hunting in a while. His parents say it's too dangerous with all the seizures he's been having. But even his growing health troubles can't dampen his mood today. In the city's downtown skyline, he makes out Traveler's Tower, 24 stories tall. Then he spies the gold dome of the state capitol building. He turns to the pilot. Did you know the capitol was built in 1878? 61 years ago. Ha, <laughs> you're pretty sharp, kid. You like history? Yeah. Well, here's a tidbit. This here's a single-engine Ryan plane. It's nearly identical to the one that Charles Lindbergh flew on the first ever flight over the Atlantic Ocean. Wow. Henry looks over the cockpit in awe, gazing at the dials and gauges. You want to take over for a minute? You mean fly it? Sure. Just reach out and grab the yoke. You'll do great. Henry hesitates before gripping the yoke with both hands. Then the pilot lets go. And over the next few minutes, he instructs Henry on how to take some gentle turns. Henry can't believe it. He's flying a plane. The last few months have been tough, but today, his heart is soaring. Down at the tarmac at the Hartford Airport stands Lizzie Malayson, Henry's mother. Through her horn-rimmed glasses, her eyes are locked on the plane circling overhead. This graduation gift for Henry wasn't cheap, but her husband Gus insisted. And the look on Henry's face when they told him, well, that was worth every penny. Still, she's worried about her only child. Since the accident, he's become so fragile it terrifies her. She takes her husband's hand for support. Do you think everything's okay up there? Gus squints upward, shading his eyes. Looks rock steady to me. How much longer? You just asked two minutes ago. He gets half an hour. Lizzie checks her watch. She won't feel secure until Henry's safe on the ground. Finally, the plane circles and maneuvers to land. Lizzie holds her breath for a full minute as it descends, then lets it all out in a whoosh when the plane rolls to a stop. A moment later, the door flies open, and Henry comes racing across the tarmac. Mom, Dad, he let me fly the plane. That was me up there. He's babbling a mile a minute, bouncing up and down in excitement. Lizzie's so relieved, she starts laughing, and Gus wraps his arm around her. Gus was right to insist on this. It's a moment her sweet boy will never forget. But right in the middle of this perfect moment, something awful happens. Henry stops speaking abruptly, and his breath gets labored. He lurches, and his fingers start to claw at his shirt. His head droops. Lizzie screams at her husband. He's overexcited. Oh, he's having another seizure. Get him to the ground. She and Gus guide Henry to the grass, where he lies with his mouth open, his eyes unfocused. After a terrible minute, it passes. Henry mutters under his breath. Mom... Where are we? He tries to sit up, but she gently holds him down. Just rest, dear. Her voice is soothing, but once Henry is lying flat again, she hisses at her husband. I knew this was a bad idea. He can't take the excitement. Don't pin this on me, Lizzie. They've been getting worse all year. It stings, but she knows he's right. Henry's epileptic seizures have become impossible to predict. They started not long after that bicycle accident. Just a few at first, then more and more frequently. Thankfully, they've been mild so far. But with each passing month, the seizures seem to escalate, both in frequency and strength. She feels her husband's hand on her shoulder. These aren't just going to go away. We need to take him to a specialist. Lizzie strokes Henry's hair. She doesn't want to admit that anything is wrong with her beautiful son. But Gus is right. Things can't keep going on like this. Henry's parents take him to several neurologists over the next two years, but no one is able to help him. To their distress, his seizures continue. At first, they're just so-called petit mal seizures, small ones. His mind goes blank for a minute, and he's groggy afterward. They're scary, but not life-threatening. Then, on his 15th birthday, Henry has his first grand mal seizure. Lizzie has no clue what triggers it. 
The three of them are riding in the car, when suddenly his arms and legs snap into a rigid position. Then his limbs start thrashing, and he foams at the mouth. For his parents, and for Henry, it's terrifying. Within a few years, Henry is having grand mal seizures nearly every day, including at school. Lizzie knows that students tease him about it. Helplessly, she watches him withdraw. First, he quits the science club, the only extracurricular activity he felt comfortable pursuing. Soon, he drops out of school altogether, her brilliantly curious child trapped at home alone. She and Gus are determined to save him. Eventually, Henry's family doctor refers him to the top brain specialist in Connecticut. The doctor puts Henry on some medications, and thankfully, they work. The number of seizures drops dramatically. Henry re-enrolls at a different high school and graduates. Even then, though, the school doesn't let him walk up to the stage to receive his diploma. They're afraid he'll cause a scene. The medicine stabilizes Henry enough that he soon lands a good job at a motor shop run by a friend of his father's. For a few years, he seems to have a shot at leading a normal life. It's mid-1952 at the Ace Motor Company in Hartford. Henry, now 26, is in the workshop, unfurling a spool of copper wire and wrapping it around the inside of a motor. Gears and belts are piled on metal shelving behind him. Everything smells of grease and solder. Here, Henry builds electrical circuits and wires motors. It's a far cry from the careers he'd imagined, but because of his condition, college seemed out of the question. And lately, things are looking up at work. That's because someone new joined the company, a secretary named Brenda. She's got curly red hair and green eyes. And best of all to Henry, she's from out of town. She knows nothing about his medical condition. He's been chatting with her a bit more each day. And today, to his delight, Brenda calls him over to her desk to talk. Hey, Henry, I heard you know how to roller skate. Is that true? Of course, I've got some moves. Henry turns away and looks back over his shoulder as if sashaying backwards. Oh, very dramatic. But what I'm really into is the banjo. Banjo? You're a man of many talents. You bet. Look at the calluses on my fingers. He holds them out, and Brenda touches them. It's an electric moment. She's looking right at him, and he screws up all his courage. Maybe we could grab a drink some night. I can show you how to play. I don't know. We barely know each other. What if I promise to roller skate and play banjo at the same time. You can't say no to that. She starts laughing, and Henry's sure she'll say yes. But at that very moment, everything goes wrong. Suddenly, he gets a funny taste in his mouth, and his vision narrows to pinholes. It's a seizure coming on, a big one. They always happen quickly like this, with virtually no warning. The last thing he sees, before crumpling to the floor, is the look of horror on Brenda's face. Henry comes to, as usual, with a crowd hovering over him. But two things are different this time. First, he's soaked in his own urine. Second, he can hear Brenda sobbing. It was awful. I've never seen anything so disturbing. It was was like a demon took over his face. Henry is devastated. How could his medication fail like this? Despite how groggy he feels, he lurches to his feet. The crowd parts, and he starts staggering towards the door. He wants to find a hole to crawl into and die. Near the door, he nearly falls down, but someone is there to catch him. It's Ray, the shop owner, a friend of his dad's. Whoa, Henry, let me help. Easy does it. Ray gets Henry to a bench, then brings him a glass of water. Now, Henry, don't you worry about it. I I want you to take the rest of the week off. I can't, Ray. No, I'm serious. You won't lose your pay. No, I mean, I can't keep doing this. I quit. Quit? You think I can ever show my face here again? I thought I had a fresh start, but... At this, Henry breaks down crying. Ray pats his back, then excuses himself, saying he's going to call Henry's father to come get him. Henry hangs his head as he waits. His doctor said there were other medications out there. They've held off trying them before because they have harsh side effects. But now, Henry doesn't care what the side effects are. Something has got to change. It's months later in a hospital waiting area in Hartford. Drooping plants sit in the corners, and old magazines are piled on the tables. Henry emerges from yet another consultation about his epilepsy, and as he enters the waiting room, he sees his parents' eyes turn toward him, searching his face for news. His mother reaches out and touches his arm. 
What did the doctor say? Nothing good. Henry slumps down heavily in a chair and holds his head in his hands. He mostly wants to be left alone right now, but his mother keeps talking, her voice getting shrill. But what did he say? Can he help you? He wants to try a different medication. That's good. Maybe this one will work. I doubt it. None of the others have. But this one might. I'm sick of medication anyway. Maybe it's time to try something else. His mother frowns at this. Like what? Well, the doctor did mention one other option. Brain surgery. Brain surgery? Oh no, that seems so drastic. I've heard about those lobotomy things. Mom, it's nothing like a lobotomy. Brain surgery nowadays is precise. It's scientific. His mother seems near tears. She sniffles and takes his father's hand. His father looks at Henry and bites his lip. Henry has never seen fear in his dad's eyes before. But there's fear there today. Are you sure surgery is a good option, son? No, I'm not sure, not at all. But I think we need to explore every option. I think you're right. Henry swallows and nods. Surgery does seem like a drastic step. But the seizures and medication have taken over his life. And surgery might be his last best chance to get his life back. American Innovations is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. I'm a huge fan of therapy. I recommend it to everyone I know if they've never done it. Even in the best of times, it's a good idea to have someone to talk to. And the way I see it, the best way to think about therapy is through some analogies. We get our cars tuned to prevent bigger issues down the road. We do chores regularly to avoid a giant mess of a house. Going to therapy is no different. It's routine maintenance for your mental and emotional wellness to prevent bigger issues down the road. And asking for help doesn't mean something's wrong with you. It means you're investing in yourself to keep your mind healthy. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Why invest in everything else and not your mind? Listeners of American Innovations get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com AI. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash A-I. It's March 1953 in the office of William Scoville, a renowned neurosurgeon at Hartford Hospital. Bookshelves with handsome, leather-bound medical volumes line the wall. There's a mostly tidy desk with stacks of medical journals, several coffee mugs, and an oversized plastic model of a brain. 27-year-old Henry Malason waits in the office, studying the decorations on the wall. Henry's impressed to see diplomas from Yale and Penn. But most of what's hanging up are pictures of Scoville. He's got a thin, dark mouth and intense hooded eyes beneath a sweeping wave of brown hair. In one picture, Scoville stands beside a flashy car, a Jaguar. In another, he's on a tropical island. In a third, he's standing in a bullring in Spain, waving his suit jacket as a bull charges. Suddenly the door opens and Scoville walks in. He's impeccably dressed, perfectly tailored suit, a paisley yellow tie. Henry glances at his own outfit, high-waisted khakis, a short sleeve collared shirt. It's the outfit he wears to his new job, assembling typewriters in a factory. He feels underdressed. But Scoville greets him warmly with a firm handshake. Ah, great to see you, Henry. And sorry to keep you waiting. I've been swamped. Sit down, please. Henry turns to sit, but nearly knocks the oversized model of the brain off the desk. Oh, sorry. Ah, you're nervous. That's understandable. But you're making the right decision here. I can lick this problem of yours. I hope so, but I want to hear more about this surgery first. It's a brand new procedure, uh, developed by a surgeon up in Canada. Brilliant guy, Rhodes Scholar. How much do you know about the brain? A little... When I was a kid, I actually thought about becoming a neurosurgeon myself one day. Except, you know, my head's all messed up. It was dumb, I know. No, it's not. You have epileptic seizures. That's nothing to be ashamed of. That's easy for you to say. No, it's true. It's just some damaged wiring in your brain. But this procedure can fix that. Scoville picks up the model of the brain on his desk. It's gray plastic 
and he can remove sections of it to reveal the structures inside. Now, you see this part on the side, above your ears? It's called the temporal lobe. Now, after I open your head up, I'm going to test different parts of the brain to see if we can find out where your seizures start. But I have my suspicions. What do you suspect? Well, inside the temporal lobe is a little structure called the hippocampus, right here. Looks like a seahorse, actually. You have two of them, one in each hemisphere of the brain. Hippocampus, okay. What does it do? Well, we're not exactly sure. We believe it's got something to do with regulating emotions, but we do know that in a lot of people with epilepsy, the hippocampus is the problem. I mentioned that surgeon in Canada. He had some patients with epilepsy, and when he removed the hippocampus on one side, their seizures got much less severe. So you want to remove my hippocampus on one side? Scoville grins. Both sides, actually. Your seizures are harsh enough that we need to be aggressive. You'll be a pioneer, Henry, like Charles Lindbergh. Henry laughs nervously. He adores Charles Lindbergh, but he's not sure he wants to be a pioneering brain surgery patient. Has anyone ever had both of them removed before? Yes, two women at the local insane asylum here. I did the uh, operations myself, and that fixed their problems? As far as the seizures, yes. They all but vanished. Far less severe and far less frequent. So you've only done this on two people in the asylum. Henry, the surgery has a great track record, trust me. After we cure your seizures, every epileptic in the country will want this. You think so? I know it. So, when do you want to schedule it? I have an opening next week. I, I might need some time to think. At this, Scoville leans forward, his intense eyes burrowing into Henry. Take all the time you need. But I do need to warn you. About what? Henry, your brain is a ticking time bomb. Given the severity of your seizures, any one of them could cause your brain to shut down completely. And then what? You would die. The seizures are that bad. This procedure works. You'll get your life back. Henry thinks about the four seizures he's had this week. If what Scoville is saying is true, then each one was a bullet dodged. That's all he needs to hear. Let's schedule the surgery. Dr. William Scoville loves brain surgery more than anything else in the world. But sports cars run a close second. Every day, he zips into the parking lot at Hartford Hospital behind the wheel of his prized possession, a cherry red Jaguar. He often tells friends that if he hadn't gone into medicine, he would have been a car mechanic. Scoville started his career doing lobotomies, back when lobotomies were respectable. But he eventually grew disillusioned with them. To Scoville, lobotomies are too blunt and crude. You destroy too much brain tissue. It's like trying to fix a car engine by whacking at it with a hammer. Instead, Scoville is pioneering a more precise approach. He studies his patient's symptoms and tries to determine the exact origin of the trouble. Just like a car mechanic can listen to an engine and instantly know if it's the carburetor or the fuel line, Scoville can then remove that malfunctioning part of the brain, and that part only. Epilepsy seems especially promising to treat this way, since seizures often originate in the temporal lobe near the ears. So Scoville has every reason to be confident that his surgery on Henry Malaysen will be a success. And if he removes Henry's hippocampus on both sides, maybe even a groundbreaking one. Even though he's performed the total hippocampus extraction on two others, they were asylum patients and not likely to lead full, independent lives afterward. Henry's case is different. Aside from his epilepsy, he's a nice, normal young man. If Scoville can cure him and give him his life back, this surgery could revolutionize treatment for epilepsy across the world. It's August 25th, 1953. A surgical theater in Hartford Hospital. An EKG machine beeps. Half a dozen nurses bustle around in blue smocks and face masks. At the center of all this activity lies Henry Malaysen on the operating table. His newly shaved head gleams under the bright surgical lights. Before the surgery starts, Dr. Scoville leans over to reassure his patient. How we feeling, champ? Ready? Yeah. Let's show these seizures who's boss. Ah, a boy. We'll make you a new man. I still can't believe I'll be awake for the operation. Miracle of modern medicine. But let's start. Nurse? 
apply the anesthetic to the scalp. The truth is, Scoville himself can hardly believe that they're able to keep patients awake during neurosurgery. But the brain has no pain receptors, so Henry won't feel anything during the operation. He just needs local anesthetic, where they'll be cutting into his scalp. It's also safer for Henry to be awake. Certain spots in the temporal lobe control important functions, like language, and Scoville wants to avoid removing those parts. So he wants Henry awake and talking throughout the procedure. When Henry's scalp is numb, Scoville starts. He slices into a wrinkle in Henry's forehead to avoid leaving an obvious scar later. Then he peels back the scalp to expose the white skull beneath. He turns to a nurse. Saw, please. Scoville is proud of this saw. He built it himself from a circular saw bit and hand crank he found at a hardware store for a dollar. After a few minutes of cranking, he removes two poker chip-sized wedges of bone from Henry's skull. And beneath those holes lie his brain, glistening and pink. It pulses faintly in time with Henry's heartbeat. With a little luck, this brain is about to make Scoville famous. Nurse, suction. The nurse hands Scoville a suction tube, which he uses to suck out cerebrospinal fluid. Doing so allows the brain to settle lower in the skull, giving Scoville more room to work. Henry, uh, you doing okay? Right as rain. Start telling us a story, a favorite childhood memory. Oh gosh, I don't know. Uh, I, I took a plane ride once. That was pretty exciting. Perfect. Uh, go into all the detail you can. Just keep talking. Well, it was just after my eighth grade graduation. Uh, my parents bought it for me as a graduation present. While Henry talks, Scoville dons a headlamp, which shines a powerful beam of light into the skull holes. Then he picks up a thin metal wire connected to a battery. With the wire, Scoville can apply a tiny bit of electricity to different parts of Henry's brain. He's hoping the electricity will produce a small seizure in Henry. That way, he'll know exactly where the seizures start, and he can remove that part of the brain. Or, failing that, he'll attack the hippocampus. Scoville tunes back into Henry's story. And my God, the clouds up there. We were sore. Uh, 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 uh. Hearing Henry gurgle, Scoville knows he's hit a language spot. He removes the metal wire and hears Henry speak up. What happened there? Nothing to worry about. Just keep talking. The clouds, you said? Because Henry didn't have a seizure, and because the language part of the brain is so important, Scoville puts a tiny piece of tissue paper on that part, so he knows to avoid it. Then he keeps hunting, zapping, here and there. Sometimes during a zap, Henry loses speech. Other times, Scoville has Henry squeeze the nurse's hand, and the zap makes his hand fall limp. Scoville carefully marks all these important spots with bits of tissue. But in no case does Henry suffer a seizure. As Scoville realizes this, he feels a rush of excitement. That means he'll get to remove the hippocampus on each side. He'll get to do the pioneering surgery. All right, you can be silent now, Henry. We're almost done. To reach the hippocampus, Scoville uses a metal instrument that looks like an elongated shoehorn to push one of the temporal lobes aside. Peering inside with the headlamp, he spots the hippocampus. It's as thick as a human thumb, about three inches long. Nurse, suction tube. With the suction tube, Scoville vacuums up the hippocampus on the right side of Henry's brain. It's just a few tablespoons of tissue with the consistency of jello, and it separates easily from the rest of the brain mass. Then Scoville shifts to the left side, moves the lobe there, and sucks that hippocampus out. In just 20 minutes, he's sure he's made medical history. The first step towards curing epilepsy forever. You still with me, Henry? I, I what? Scoville doesn't like the sound of Henry grasping for words. I want to go inside now. You are inside, Henry. Scoville is relieved to hear that Henry's language is intact. Just a little disorientation, that's all. But just to be sure, Scoville decides to test his memory. What are your parents' names? Gus and Lizzie? Good, good. And, and where were you born? Manchester. Scoville is thrilled. Everything seems perfect. Excellent. Now, tell me more about that plane ride while we finish up. Plane ride? Was I telling you about that? Scoville shakes his head. Poor kid. He's probably exhausted. But that's expected after major brain surgery. They've been at this for hours. He leans over Henry, smiling down at him. Don't worry about it. 
but let me be the first to congratulate you. All your troubles are about to be over. And with that, Scoville starts to close up Henry's skull and reattach his scalp. The surgery is over, and as far as Scoville can tell, it was a resounding success. Finding the time or motivation to fit in a workout during the busy holiday season can be tough. But with Peloton, you'll get a fitness experience that's so entertaining and fun, you'll actually be looking forward to your next session. With its authentic instructors and unique immersive content, the Peloton experience is unmatched. Working out doesn't feel like a chore because there's always something new to discover. There's an endless variety of classes to keep your workouts feeling fresh, from cycling to strength, yoga, bar, meditation, and more. And Peloton instructors curate playlists to motivate you for every mood, from hip-hop to country, rock to pop, and everything in between. Plus, you get free access to the Peloton app when you purchase a Peloton bike. That means your favorite classes go where you go this holiday season. I've been on the bike many times, and it is a great workout with so much room for personalization to your life and your fitness goals. Visit OnePeloton.com to learn more. And try Peloton classes free for the rest of the year. New members only. Visit OnePeloton.com slash app to learn more. Terms apply. Peloton. When your workout is a joy, it's a joy to work out. It's early September, 1953, a week after Henry Molaison's radical brain surgery. He's lying in a hospital bed with pristine white sheets, his head still wrapped in white bandages. Curtains with tiny sailboats decorate the windows, and there's a lovely view of a park across the street. But Lizzie Molaison, sitting at her son's bedside, can't enjoy the view. Her husband has to work, so she's been here alone with Henry all week. And Henry's slow recovery and odd behavior is starting to frustrate her. For the 20th time in the past hour, she bats his hand away from his forehead. Henry, don't pick at your bandages. It'll get infected. I've told you a dozen times. You did? A about the bandages? Lizzie scowls and just shakes her head. Dr. Scoville said Henry might be confused for a while, but this is getting absurd. Henry looks around pensively, then sees the clock. Holy moly, it's, it's 1 p.m. Isn't it lunchtime yet? Lizzie is baffled. Henry, you just ate. A hamburger and fries, L look. She points to the far side of the room. There sits a tray with two empty plates and a smear of ketchup. Did I eat that? You devoured it. Don't you remember? I, I guess not. Lizzie takes a breath and reminds herself to be patient. The dementia exams she requested all gave good results. His language and problem-solving skills are perfectly intact. And he can remember things from throughout his life. He just seems perpetually distracted. A dog begins barking in the park across the street. Henry cranes his neck to look. He's always loved animals. Ah, that looks like Uncle Mick's dog. A black lab. Yes, you mentioned that a few minutes ago. And for the last time, stop picking your bandages. Henry looks ashamed, then falls silent. After a minute, he starts chewing his lip. Lizzie wonders what he's thinking. Mom, can I ask you something? What, Henry? She leans forward toward her son. Is it lunchtime yet? Lizzie sighs. Her patience is officially exhausted. How much longer will this confusion last? It's two weeks later. William Scoville sits at his desk in his office, grading a test. Correct? Correct again. What he's scoring is the IQ test he just administered to Henry Molaison. Henry took an IQ test before his surgery as well, and now Scoville wants to see if he's lost any IQ points because of the surgery. It's a tense moment. On the one hand, Scoville's been thrilled with the results of the surgery so far. He hasn't had time to visit Henry for more than a few minutes, and according to nurses, he's supposedly still a bit confused. But he's only had a couple of minor seizures since having his hippocampus removed, and no major ones, which is great news. Still, there are other considerations. If his IQ is dropped, that's a big strike against the surgery. Once Scoville finishes marking Henry's answers, right or wrong, he tallies up the score, his stomach in a knot. That's 42 correct and 8 wrong. 
And that works out to... He flips open a thick testing reference book. Before the surgery, Henry's mind had been dulled by the epilepsy medications, which sometimes made it hard for him to concentrate. He was having seizures so often that he was usually exhausted, too. But Scoville noticed that he looked good taking the test today and got through it in one sitting. Still, it all depends on the final score. Scoville's finger finds the entry in a table, and when he sees it, he nearly jumps up in excitement. 117! He double-checks the previous test score, hardly able to believe his eyes. In that test, Henry had scored 104. That means his IQ has jumped 13 points in two weeks. The surgery hasn't harmed his IQ at all. It's raised it. This is a huge breakthrough. Scoville has not only cured one of the worst cases of epilepsy he's ever seen, but the kid got an IQ boost as a bonus. It makes Scoville feel incredibly powerful. This surgery is going to revolutionize medicine. He grabs the test and races off to tell Henry the news. A minute later, Scoville bursts into Henry's room, waving the test over his head. I got your results, Henry. It's great news. He's surprised to see Henry look tense. I, I'm, I'm sorry, do, do I know you? Scoville raises an eyebrow. This confusion of Henry's is getting to be a real concern. It should be tapering off at this point. I'm your neurosurgeon, Dr. Scoville. Oh, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon once, but I, I couldn't. My head's all messed up. I have epilepsy, you see. Yes, no, I know. But don't give up that dream just yet. Your seizures have plummeted. Your test results look great, too. Test? Was there a test? Well, uh, yes, you took it a half hour ago. Don't you remember? Don't these problems look familiar? He thrusts the paper into Henry's hands and watches him study the little diagrams and logic puzzles. I don't recall this. It was to help judge how well your brain surgery went. Did I have my surgery already? Scoville is incredulous. Oh, yes. What do you think those bandages are for? Henry touches his head and looks confused. Then he rises from his bed and goes over to examine the bandages in the mirror. Suddenly, he seems to see Scoville's reflection in the mirror and looks startled. I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you come in. Who are you? You're a neurosurgeon. Oh, I, you know, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon once, but I couldn't because my head's all messed up. I have epilepsy, you see. Now Scoville really doesn't know what to think. It almost seems like Henry is playing games with him. He tries to play along. Uh, very funny, Henry. If you're pretending you have amnesia, you're not doing a very good job. You remember your name, don't you? Uh, of course, I, I'm, I'm Henry. And who am I? You are, um... I'm sorry, I, I, I can't remember. Now Scoville is steamed. He snatches the IQ test from Henry's hands. I don't know what game you're playing, Henry, but knock it off. I'll come back when you stop behaving like a child. We'll discuss your IQ results then. Henry flinches, looking hurt, but doesn't say anything as Scoville storms out. In the corridor, he spots a nurse. Marcia, I'd like a word with you. What is it, doctor? What's going on with the patient in 215, Henry Malayson? He's surprised to see the nurse roll her eyes. Oh, God, he's the most exasperating patient we've ever had. What do you mean? Every five minutes, he wants to know why he's there, what the bandages are for. I've heard about his banjo a dozen times. I've noticed that. He repeats himself sometimes. Sometimes. I try constantly. But it's worse than that. Every time I introduce myself, he forgets my name. I can't even drop off breakfast without him asking again. And I've showed him where the bathroom is at least a hundred times. He's a total amnesiac. He's not an amnesiac. His memories are perfectly intact. He's just haywiring right now. Have the other nurses noticed? The nurse snorts. <laughs> It'd be impossible not to. What did you do to him, anyway? He's more messed up than when he came in here. At this, Scoville gets angry. Uh, don't take that tone with a surgeon. I'm in charge of this ward. You serve here at my discretion. I apologize, doctor. But something screwy in that kid's head. Now, if you'll excuse me. The nurse leaves Scoville standing there, baffled. And worried now that his incredibly successful surgery maybe wasn't such a success after all. What in the world is wrong? with Henry Molaison. Scoville has seen cases of amnesia before, and they don't resemble Henry's. It's not that he's lost his memory. It's more like he just keeps forgetting where he is or what he's doing. 
And he keeps saying and doing the same things over and over again. But why? Henry Molaison might no longer have seizures, but it's possible that he now has something even worse. From Wondery, this is episode one of The Man With No Memory on American Innovations. A quick note about the recreations you've been hearing. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said. These scenes are dramatizations, but they're based on historical research. If you want to learn more about Henry Molaison and other harrowing cases like this, we recommend Sam Keen's The Tale of the Dueling Neurosurgeons. American Innovations is hosted by me, Stephen Johnson. For more information on my books about science and innovation, including my latest, Extra Life, which is also a TV series on PBS, you can visit my website, stephenberlinjohnson.com, or follow me on Twitter at Stephen B. Johnson, sign up for my new Substack newsletter, adjacentpossiblesubstack.com. This episode was written by Sam Keen, with editing by Liza Veal. Audio post-production and sound design by Woodlands Audio. Produced by Emily Frost. Our senior producer is Andy Herman. Our executive producers are Jenny Lauer-Beckman and Marshall Louie for Wondering.